never say amen? amen? Amen. God's been good to us. Second Chronicles chapter 20 this morning. And want to look at a continuation of what we began looking at last week. Here in Second Chronicles chapter number 20, we read of King Jehoshaphat. And uh, we are reminded Jehoshaphat overall was a good king in Judah. He did make a grave mistake in making a lot, an alliance with King Ahab. But uh, he was corrected over that. And really from that point after that, really began making some very good and wise decisions, both spiritually as well as for the nation as a whole. And so we come to 2 Chronicles chapter number 20, and he is facing a very grave threat. Matter of fact, he doesn't know what to do. Have you ever found yourself there? Don't know what to do. Maybe it's in a situation, maybe a work situation, a family situation, but you just don't know what to do, and uh, you're questioning, Lord, I don't know what to do. I want to make the right decision, but don't know what the right decision is. Or maybe you're facing trouble, and you've gotten yourself in a predicament, and now what do I do? I found myself many times there as a young man. Uh, now what do I do? I've gotten myself in this predicament. How do I get out of this? Well, he's in a grave situation, and what does he do? Well, Jehoshaphat makes some interesting decisions. As a matter of fact, we can learn from his decisions because they were very wise decisions. And uh, I like the responses that he had. And so I want to begin reading in verse number 1, just to give you some background. You'll recognize this text if you tuned in last week. But notice 2 Chronicles 20, beginning in verse number 1. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with their other uh, beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazanah Tamar, which is in Engedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord, proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And so we see in those verses, particularly verse number 3 and verse number 4, his first response, which it ought to be our first response, and that's this, Jehoshaphat sought the Lord. He went to the Lord with his problem. You know, oftentimes we go to others, uh, we may even go to a spouse, we go to a, a pastor, another counselor, nothing wrong with that, except we need to go to the Lord first. God says in the multitude of counselors, there's great safety. I believe they're there for our good and for our help. But ultimately, I think the Lord gets pushed down. And when we're maybe in trouble, when we don't know what to do, then we go to the Lord. Jehoshaphat, right at the onset, he seeks God's face. Can I remind you, that is a key ingredient when it comes to revival. Seeking God's face. And he was willing to do that. And by the way, I believe God was pleased with that. We looked at verses in Scripture that remind us how important it is to seek God's face. Seek the kingdom of God. And so he does that. Secondly, we looked at this in verses 5 and 6. He reverences God for who he is. And we notice two things that he says in verse number 6. O Lord, Yahweh, the self-existent one... And then he says, God of our fathers. That is Elohim, a God of strength and of power. He recognizes he may be outmanned, he may be outnumbered, but he is going to call out to the self-existent, powerful God. And he does that. And he reverences God for who he is. And we were reminded of this truth. We cannot praise God for who he is if we do not know God for who he is. And so we must know God. We must be in His Word, uh, learning about Him. He has revealed Himself to us. He wants us to know Him. And in doing so, we need to reverence Him. So we see that He takes time to, with the right focus, seek God's face. He takes time to reverence God for who He is. Then in verse 7 through 9, we see that He reflects upon what God has done. That's a song that Brother Stephen's just saying. Lord, you've been good to me. And he goes back in, in, the, in the history of the nation of Israel and really reflects on what God has done. He, he reminds God, oh, you've done this for our, for our fathers. You've done this for our nation. And he's just going to reflect a little bit. Listen, that is good for us to do, by the way. 
just stop and look back. Yeah, we come to trying times and go back to those times where the Lord has helped us. The Lord has enabled us. The Lord has strengthened us. When our strength has failed, His strength was exactly what we needed. And so He reflects there upon what God has done. By the way, we mentioned in closing last week, Solomon in his prayer, he did the very same thing. Uh, remember his prayer of dedication? He's dedicating the temple to the Lord. And what he does is he goes back and he is just remembering how God's delivered him from famine and pestilence. And he's done all these wonderful things. Could, could I remind you, God likes to be reminded of those things. He doesn't need it. To, he doesn't have an ego. But he likes to be reminded because in reminding him, we're reminding ourselves of who he is. He knows that. He wants us to be reminded of that. Then I want you to pick up in verse number 10. We see our fourth thing, we see the fourth thing that Jehoshaphat does. Beginning in verse number 10, notice in these three verses, in verses 10 through 12, uh, we'll read them together. And now, behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? Notice his phrase. For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know what we to do. You ready to see the fourth thing? Fourth thing he does is this. He realizes his insufficiency. He realizes his insufficiency. He says, Lord, we don't know what to do. But notice the last phrase of verse number 12. But our eyes are on you. Folks, that's the right place to be. Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, I don't know what the right decision is. But Lord, my eyes are upon you. Uh, you know when you uh, go, you remember the first time you went to apply for a job? Anybody remember the first job you had? And you go in there to apply for that job, and you just got to make sure everything is just right. Now, perhaps it was a job where you had to have a resume ready, or maybe you're just going in and you're talking to that person in HR, or whatever, that, whatever the job was, and you go in, and what are you doing? You are trying to show why you're qualified for this job. I mean, so you got it laid out. I mean, you have listed education that you've had and experience, and I've done this and this and this and this. Have you ever read one of those resumes and you looked and like, what is that going to help me? I mean, why did that matter that you did that? But the, you, hey, you want everybody to know, here's what I've done. Here's why I think I'm qualified for that job. Do you know sometimes we approach God in the very same way? Hey, Lord, let me, uh, let me show you why I can't do that because I don't have the qualifications for that area. Or, Lord, here's why I think I would be good at this. This is not what Jehoshaphat is doing. You know what he's saying? Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, as a matter of fact, I don't know where to turn, but I know this, my eyes are upon you. Here's what you'll find out. When you come to the Lord, he doesn't use people who think they're capable who think they're all that. As a matter of fact, he likes people who think he, he likes it when we think we're not. When we think we can't do it. You know why? Because when it happens, he gets the glory. If we think we can do it, then it's going to be very easy for us to say, hey, look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at how well that went. But when we come with insufficiencies, and think in Scripture how many people there were like that. David, youngest of the brothers. As a matter of fact, even his father in somewhat, you can maybe say, look down upon disdain. Oh, he's just out there keeping the sheep. God used him mightily. Uh, you think about his life. You think about Mary. Uh, how many would have chosen Mary to be the mother of the king of kings? The earthly mother. How about uned ed ed uneducated Peter? Easy for you to say. Uneducated Peter. Who would have picked him to preach powerfully? And the list could go on and on. But in God's unexpected plan, you know what he uses? He uses people who don't see themselves as capable. They are weak. They may seem helpless. They may seem uh, insufficient. And God reminds us uh, by the wonder of his grace, that's exactly what he desires to do. Because it's he that has called us. And he says when he calls us, he will enable and equip us. Second Peter chapter 1 
verses 3 and 4, whereby are given unto us great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We've been given promises of God. And you know what happens is we have been enabled by God and by His grace to do what we may think we cannot do. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 12, verse number 9, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities. I'm going to glory in my weaknesses. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. When's the last time you took, took time to thank the Lord for your weaknesses? Lord, thank you that I, I, I can't do those things, but Lord, I know that you'll enable me to do that. Here's what Jehoshaphat does in his life. He is saying, Lord, we don't know what to do. This adversary has come against us. They're bigger than we are. And yet, Lord, we are reminded of how good of a God you are. Lord, we're reflecting of how you've helped us in the past. And Lord, we realize we cannot do this. But when you remind him that you can't, what he'll remind you of is that he can. So realize your insufficiencies. And when we are weak, then he is strong. And that's when God gets the glory. Look at verse number 13. We see a fifth thing that he does. It says there in verse number uh, 13, And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then down in verse number 15, he said, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. I like this. For the battle is not yours, but God's. So here's the fifth thing. Jehoshaphat reminds himself of truth. He is reminded of truth truth. Here's the truth. Joshua, this battle is not yours. This battle is God's. And there's been times maybe in your life you've said, Lord, I don't know how to or I don't know what to do in this situation. Lord, I don't know how to, uh, I don't know how to fix my marriage. Lord, I don't know how to uh, fix this relationship that, that has um, been, been harmed in my family. Lord, I don't know to, uh, how to handle this health problem that you've allowed into my life. There's people right now that are saying, Lord, I don't know how to deal with this pandemic that's going across this country. But here's what Joshua would say, keep your eyes on the Lord. Lord, I don't know what to do. This isn't my battle. This is your battle. But Lord, my eyes are upon you. And here's what Jehoshaphat recognized. He had God on his side. And therefore, because God was on his side, he had God's solution to the problem. If God is on your side, you always have a solution to your problem. The battle is not ours, but God's. So remind yourself of truth. Look, um, uh, continuing at verse number uh, 17. He tells him, don't be afraid, don't fear. He says in verse 17, you shall uh, not need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand ye still, see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go against them, for the Lord will be with you. That word dismayed, interesting word. It can also be translated discouraged. In the definition, it literally means to be shattered or filled with terror. They're not just a little scared. They're a lot scared. I mean, they are, their fear is just mounting up. They look out and they see, what are we going to do? And he says, be not afraid. Don't fear. Almost recognizing how fearful they are. Don't even be dismayed. Why? Well, because God is with you. This isn't your battle. This is his. Remember God told Joshua the very same thing. Hey, Joshua, be of a good Courage. Don't be dismayed. Why? Because Joshua had the truth. And we have the truth. Here's what God's word says. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye might have peace in this world. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Here's his promise. Are you ready? John 16, 33. I have overcome the world. You know, as I look and you, you hear the media and the news and you hear what people are saying, you know, I sit and think, you know, I've read the back of the book. I know who wins. Amen. I'm not worried about this. I'm not fearful about this. Hey, at some point, something's going to take me. I just don't know what it'll be. I'm hoping it's a rapture. All right, that's what I'm really hoping for. 
I'm hoping that I, I'm here when that happens. But if not, it might be the coronavirus. It might be an accident. It might be my wife taking me out in my sleep. I don't know. It's going to be something, okay? But at some point, I'm going to die. And so why am I fearful about, why would I be fearful about this pandemic? Do you know, and you may be sitting here thinking, well, I'm not either. But are there things in your life that Satan has come in and tried to get you to be fearful about? Or maybe there's a problem that you have and you just think it's, it's not fixable. There's no hope. Well, listen, you need to remind yourself of truth. It's not your battle, it's God's. And you've got to remind yourself of that truth. And that is the, the truth. Uh, we looked at this verse uh, a couple Sunday nights ago. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. That's exactly what Jehoshaphat does. He reminds himself of truth. Once you look there, beginning in verse number 18, at what he does next, very important. And Jehoshaphat, in verse 18, bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Once again, we've noticed this, worshiping in Scripture is intrinsically connected to bowing, to falling on one's face. He does that. And the Levites and the children of uh, the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. I want you to notice, sixthly, he remembers to trust. He reminds himself of truth. And then he remembers who his trust is in. Have you ever wondered in the world we live in today who you can trust? I hope you don't trust the media. I hope you don't trust politicians. You say, who can I trust? I don't even know if I can trust that person I work with. Who can I trust? came across this article uh, as I was studying for this message. This was written back in November of 2017. It was entitled, Who Can You Trust in a Post-Truth World? Quite long article. I just pulled a, a few snippets out of it. But I thought it was an interesting. This is written from a secular perspective, by the way. Here's what they said. Trust has always been a dangerous business. Every instance of it brings the risk of letdown, disloyalty, and betrayal. Still, in recent times, the vulnerability inherent in trust seems more pronounced. Technological advancements enabling increased access to information mean that awareness of corporate scandals, fake news, and political lies has increased exponentially. And we'd say, yes, there's truth to that. Of course, our access to information also makes it easier to learn about the good being done in the world. But somehow, scandal always lodges in the memory better than integrity. As a result, it's hard to resist being conditioned to expect just about everything we read in the news or hear an expert say will turn out to be a lie, politically motivated or simply wrong. Can I remind you this was written in 2017? The skepticism lies at the heart of our post-truth and post-trust times. And yet, just when truth is said to be irrelevant and trust all but gone, these concepts feature heavily in contemporary social, social discourse. It's no coincidence. As the late philosopher Annette Byer said, we inhabit a climate of trust as we inhabit an atmosphere and notice it as we notice air only when it becomes scarce or polluted. I thought that was powerful. You know, when we notice it, when we recognize, well, wait a minute, who can I trust? Where is truth? The article continues, in this era of post-truth scandals, falsity, deception have created a vacuum, leaving many of us all the more aware of just how scarce truth and trust must be. The trust is more scarce, uh, the, is not just a perceived reality, but a measurable one. The PR firm, Edelman, has been assessing global levels of trust for the past 17 years. The most recent trust barometer reported this. Two-thirds of the countries surveyed now are distrusters. Less than 50% trust in the mainstream institutions of business, government, media to do what is right. Over two-thirds of the general population are not confident that current leaders can address their country's challenges. The media is distrusted in more than 80% of countries surveyed. For Edelman, these findings amount to a crisis of trust because they find a correlation between trust and social functioning. And I conclude with what he said here. This was a direct quote. 
We have moved beyond the point of trust being simply a key factor in product purchase or selection of employment opportunity. It is now the deciding factor in whether a society can function. As trust in institution erodes, the basic assumptions of fairness, shared values, and equal opportunity traditionally upheld by the system are no longer taken for granted. You know, that's interesting. We live in a world where who can you trust? Listen, we have the answer, folks. We have truth right here, and we can trust it. And yet often, if we're honest, we don't live like we can trust it. Well, I know God said that, but, you know, that was so many years ago. Still the same. He doesn't change. Well, I know he said if I do that, then he would do this, but he doesn't understand the situation I'm in. Oh, yes, he does. And if you've got God on your side, you've got God's solution. So here's what Jehoshaphat does. He remembers to trust. All right. I can trust you. Lord, you've told us to do this. I'm killing. I have made mistakes and those were not good. I don't want to go back to that. I'm going to trust here. And so God revealed to them directly. Here's what I want you to do. Here's exactly what I want you to do. And all you must do is exercise your faith. And by the way, that is the key to, to, to victory all throughout scripture. It's not what you can do. He's already said he is the victory. He's overcome the world. So it is placing our trust, exercising our faith in what he has already said. And then he does it. The walls of Jericho, the battles that the children of Israel face, illustrations of Paul in the New Testament. He did it and was obedient and God gave the victory. So let's see what God says to do. He tells them very specifically. Look again at verse number 16. He says... Joshua, uh, uh, back to verse number 16, we were at 18. Tomorrow, here's what he's told to do. Go ye down against them. Now here's a question. Difficult instructions? No. All right, Joshua, here's the answer. I want you to go down against them. Okay. That's all I want you to do. Just go down. I've already told you, it's not your battle, it's mine, I'm going to fight it, but you must obey, you must exercise faith, and you must go down. By the way, can you think of things in Scripture that God's told you to do? Here's all I want you to do, I want you to do this right here. Just, just obey what I've said. He says, go down. But then in verse number 18, he tells him to do something else. It says that Joshua had bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. So you go down, but secondly, Joshua says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship. We're going to worship the Lord. Then in verse number 19, I like this one. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel. All right, very simple at this point. Go down. Worship and praise God. But there was a key. And you need to get this, all right? Look at the end of verse number 18. Or, uh, verse number uh, 19. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Would you look at that last phrase? What does it say? With a loud voice. Sometimes we Baptists, we like to praise, but we do it very quietly. Praise the Lord. Wouldn't want anybody to think I'm too excited about this. They praise with a loud voice. <laughs> winning side. Can I remind you that as you go out and about, you're on the winning side. Man, I'm telling you, I walk into Lowe's and I'm whistling and I'm smiling and people are like, you know. You might see me around town. I asked my mother-in-law this week if she will make me a Lone Ranger mask. And I'm going to walk into the store and they're going to say, excuse me, sir, where's your mask? And I'm going to say, I'm wearing it. That's not a mask. I said, did you ever watch The Lone Ranger? <laughs> you know what? It's interesting. People are fearful, but you can praise the Lord. I mean, you can rejoice. Don't do it quietly. Do it with a loud voice. By the way, you're not going to do it out there if you don't do it here. Praise the Lord. Very simple. Go down. Worship. Praise the Lord. But then I like verse 20. We'll conclude here. And they rose early in the morning. And went forth in the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall ye be established. Believe his prophets. So shall ye prosper. Very simple. Uh, just believe that God can do it. Just believe him. 
Whatever the situation is, I don't know what to do. I'm just at the end of my rope. I, I've tried everything. All right, have you recognized that it's not your battle, it's God's? And he has the solution? Are you willing to just simply believe that God can do it? The instructions weren't hard. By the way, can I remind you? His commandments are not grievous. He doesn't do it to make them hard. He just wants us to obey what they say. Go down, worship, praise, but just believe God can do it. And by the way, just for the sake of time, let me tell you, they did it and they won. Do we need to flip back to the book of Revelation? Can I remind you, we win too? But he wants us to be obedient. He wants us to do what he has said. Are there times in our lives that we're not going to know what to do? Yes. There's going to be decisions that we're going to have to make. And, and we may not be able to clearly determine, oh, man, I don't know exactly what to do. Maybe what path to take. Uh, I'm all overwhelmed by the circumstances that I'm facing. I'm confused. But when those times come, the way we demonstrate our faith, here's what he says. Do things that he has clearly told us. Just be obedient to what he said. If you obey what he has clearly written and what he has clearly spoken in scripture, he's the one that directs your path. You don't have to worry about 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. As a matter of fact, you don't got to worry about tomorrow. Just obey today. Get your eyes in his word. Seek him first. Watch and he will take care of the rest. One pastor said this. It's not the things I don't understand about the Bible that bother me. It's the things I understand with perfect clarity and don't comply with that keep me up at night. What areas are we not being obedient? Because if we're not seeing victory, it's not God's fault. It's, right, it's our obedience to this book right here. What do I do when I don't know what to do? What do I do? How do I have confidence in a crisis that I face? Here's what he says. Seek God's face. That's the right focus. Reverence God for who he is. Reflect upon what God has done. Realize your insufficiency. Remember and remind yourself of truth. Remember to trust in what God has said. And I want to challenge you today. In any crisis, governmental, political, personal, health, any, any crisis that you face, you as a believer can have confidence in a God who's not going to leave you. It's not your battle, it's his. And he'll fight it. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning to be a people that trust. Help us to be a people that obey. Help us be a people that to, are reminded of truth. Help us to be a people that realize how insufficient we are. We can't do it. And maybe there's an area that you have asked us to do. You, you want us to, to submit, and yet we think, well, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not qualified for that. Well, the truth is... It, Faithful is he who called you who also will do it. Maybe we just need to say, Lord, I'm willing. If you'll enable me, Lord, I want to do that. With heads bowed, eyes closed. Could I ask you this morning, is there someone here that would say, you know, there's, there's a crisis that I'm facing right now in my, in my family, in a relationship, in a work situation, in a health situation. To be honest, don't know what to do. I need wisdom. And I'm asking God's help. But I recognize I need it. There was one of those areas there was one of those areas that you could, um, you could associate with. Maybe your insufficiency.